Johnny Kiram is an analyst who covers the IoT space as well as uh, microservices and is really writes a lot about uh, what's happening in IoT. So very excited to have Johnny on the call today. Um, and we'll be asking him a number of questions. So that'll be fun. Also have Bill Appleton, who's the CEO of Dream Factory. And we'll be talking to Bill a lot about how REST APIs uh, work in IoT and, and a bit about um, Dream Factory and the open source product that we've released um, uh, that really solves a lot of IoT challenges. So in terms of structure today, uh, we're gonna talk briefly about the current state of IoT, kind of the landscape. Johnny's gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about how REST APIs are really uh, a huge asset and super important for IoT development. Bill's gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, Johnny will talk about how MQTT and REST uh, really play together really well. And we'll point you to some additional details that you can read up on about that. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about how to deploy IoT in production and specifically how you can uh, deploy Dream Factory to really uh, you know, get real production grade IoT applications out there. So we'll, we'll try to get very practical for everyone on the line today. So with that, let's jump right in. Um, I'd like to start with Johnny. So Johnny, how would you describe the current state of IoT, uh, the technology stack today? Kind of what are the key parts of the stack, important standards, and the players that you're seeing out there as you, as you write about this space? Sure. So Internet of Things is not really new. It's been around for a couple of decades. But what's driving the traction today is the rise of cloud, big data, and analytics. So if you actually remove the equation, uh, remove the components like big data and cloud from the equation of IoT, the value is very less. So the emergence of abundant storage, ample computing power, and the capability to analyze the data that is that is being stored in the cloud is, is one of the biggest drivers for Internet of Things. So uh, given the fact that it is cloud, which is acting as the key driver, it, it, it's very obvious that the top public cloud players like Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Salesforce, and Oracle, uh, and of course IBM, are uh, pushing the envelope when it comes to Internet of Things. So uh, it, it, it's very clear that the existing traditional connected devices and industrial automation equipment is now connected to the cloud. And from there, the heavy lifting is taken over by the existing technology stack. So in a way, it's an extension of industrial automation that's been around for a couple of decades. So there are multiple players. Obviously, the, the pioneer in, in industrial Internet of Things and uh, the convergence of cloud is driven by Amazon Web Services. It's one of the first company to go live with AWS IoT. Uh, and, and they acquired a company called uh, Telemetry, which enabled them to offer Internet of Things as a platform, uh, primarily as, as a pass. And this was followed by Microsoft, uh, who now has a very, uh, very mature offering in, in, in the form of Azure IoT. Uh, and it's one of the most comprehensive offerings because Microsoft's interest in delivering embedded devices in the form of Windows 10 IoT core to all the way up to the business intelligence driven by Power BI is positioning Microsoft as a very prominent player in this space. Uh, interestingly, Google has been late to the party. They just announced uh, their IoT pass in a, in a in a technical preview, uh, in a private uh, preview mode just last week. So uh, those are the top public cloud play players. Of course, Salesforce has been uh, talking about connecting their CRM service to Internet of Things, and Oracle has extended their cloud platform for IoT. Uh, then there are some traditional companies like PTC Thingworks uh, and, and uh, uh, companies like GE and Bosch, who are also driving the momentum around Internet of Things. So. So that's the broad picture when it comes to the key players and the landscape. Now, in terms of technology, uh, Internet of Things has a very interesting stack. So on one extreme end of the spectrum, we have devices. So if there are no devices, there is, there is no Internet of Things solution. So uh, on one extreme end of the spectrum, we have devices. And these devices are very traditional, legacy, age-old uh, equipment that, that is not even aware of internet protocols. Uh, then we have slightly modern contemporary devices that can talk the IP protocols and they are capable of making a rest call to the outside world. They are, they are more contemporary. 
and then we have the uh, the 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 emergence of a new appliance or a or a new uh, a device which is actually called as an iot gateway and that's going to be responsible for representing these legacy non ip devices to the outside world to the to the rest of the platform uh, so so they are the devices layer on one end of the spectrum so obviously there is a lot of data that is going to be generated by these devices and that's going to be ingested into the cloud or the iot platform and, and that's where we have big data services coming in for example apache kafka is playing a, a very significant role in ingesting the high velocity high throughput data and after that it is all about uh, etl pipeline so it is basically extract transform and load uh, and after that it goes through the, the layers like uh, Apache Spark, Apache Strom, and eventually Apache Hadoop. And of course, the availability of machine learning algorithms is also helping companies to, to create predictive analytics on top of the sensor data, which is leading to preventive maintenance and predictive maintenance. So before a machine really fails, it's going to send some, some signals that are going to be intercepted by the data processing pipeline and machine learning intelligent algorithms to to figure out uh, which machine is going to fail and that's going to be more predictive or it's sometimes even preventive uh, in terms of analytics. So once the data goes through that pipeline, it ultimately gets processed, stored in a, in a NoSQL or a relational database or a data warehouse. And that's going to be analyzed using uh, a traditional BI front end, something like a Tableau or a Pentaho or some of the more uh, emerging dashboarding tools like Power BI, uh, Amazon QuickSight, and, and so on. So that's that's the pipeline. And the, the most interesting aspect about an IoT solution is devices comprise of the 10%. That is only the tip of the iceberg. There's a misconception that Internet Internet of Things is all about electronics, hardware, microcontrollers, and, and system on chip computers. But the reality is they only comprise of 10% of the solution stack. 90% of IoT heavy lifting is all about data. And, and that's where there is a tremendous opportunity for developers, platform companies, uh, and system integrators to uh, connect the dots, to, to really um, surface the insights and, and, and convert the raw data coming out of the sensors into, into actionable insights that can be fed into rest of the uh, line of business systems or existing business intelligence systems. So um, it's pretty hard to explain, but uh, you know, as we visualize, it is, it is basically a very well-structured pipeline, uh, which is raw data on one side and meaningful insights and actionable insights at the other side. And the magic happens uh, within the platform. But, but again, uh, that's a bit of oversimplification. Uh, the way the sensors and the devices talk to each other, uh, the way the data is being fed, then the, the communication among these components, which are uh, most probably coded, compiled, and deployed as microservices. All of that uh, is pretty complex, and there are multiple protocols that are involved at every layer. Uh, for example, the sensor networks use protocols like BACnet uh, and, and SCADA and RTU, which are very, very traditional, uh, almost legacy protocols that no one understands in the current context, but they have been around for a long time. From there to very, very contemporary protocols like Bluetooth, Low Energy, uh, LoRa, Wave, uh, Thread, Z-Wave, Zigbee. You know, these are all some of the M2M protocols that are very popular uh, within the sensor network. Uh, and then obviously applications are talking via MQTT, uh, REST, and, and, and uh, the standard protocols that support both PubSub for asynchronous and more request response for synchronous. So, so it, is, it is very fragmented at this point, uh, the way the applications are built, the way the sensor uh, and the devices are talking to each other. Uh, it's very fragmented. There is no standardization. There, there are no uh, well-defined protocols that are aligned with the use cases. Uh, but but the good news is uh, it is evolving. It is becoming more and more standardized. Uh, and 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 the convergence of MQTT and REST plays a very critical role in taking this forward. That was a great overview. I think it's it's you know one key takeaway is just there. there are, like you said at the end, there are, it's very fragmented. There are a lot of moving pieces. I'd love to um, shift the discussion a little and, and ask Bill a question um, about how, you know, Bill, how you see REST APIs fitting into the IoT stack and specifically about the evolution of Dream Factory there. 
So maybe you can comment uh, a little bit about that and how you know REST fits into this whole uh, stack that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have some great customers who are doing interesting things with the Internet of Internet of Things, and you know they're they're doing all kinds of different projects, whether it's you know gathering data from industrial machinery or you know other kind of information from automobiles or from consumers or other machines, consumer appliances. You know, one thing I've noticed though is that the the IoT stack is is sometimes a pretty challenging one. It's a big stack. You know, they can end up needing to write software for a device and then implement their own networking strategy for some gateway. And then um, you know, then then they're just getting started with, you know, they've got a lot of data. How do they put it in the cloud and then how do they get it into a particular database and then you know, at that point, how do they analyze the data? And even how do they build apps on top of, you know, the entire stack so that humans can analyze and control um, these devices? And so, you know, one thing I've I've noticed is, you know, the Dream Factory API platform um, is, is a very uh, fundamentally useful type of thing in this environment. You can install it on any cloud and you can hook it up to any database and you can use it to put data in or to get data out of that database. Um, and you can also write apps on it. So you know, just breaking that down a little bit, you know, when we say any cloud, you know, one thing we've worked on over the years here with Dream Factory is compatibility with a whole bunch of different environments. Uh, first of all, it's just a LAMP stack. So you can install it anywhere that you would normally install a LAMP stack. And uh, so you could install it on-premise if you just have a server. Um, you could install it in the cloud. We work, of course, with Bitnami to build install packages. So you know we support all the major clouds, um, AWS, uh, and, uh, um, Microsoft Azure, um, Oracle. Uh, you know, so there's a whole bunch of different clouds out there, and we make it really easy to install on any of them. And you can also do things, you know, like platform as a service or Kubernetes. Um, we have a Docker package. And so, you know, when you get that installation going, it's highly scalable and you can scale it either horizontally or vertically. And we'll, we'll probably dive into that a little bit more later. But, you know, then once it's installed, you can hook it up to any backend data source. And, you know, we've, we've worked over the years to, to knock down as many of those as we can. But, you know, the, the big categories are SQL, NoSQL, and file storage. And, you know, SQL is just, you know, kind of a who's who of SQL databases, everyone from SQL Server to Oracle to MySQL and Postgres and on and on. Um, NoSQL as well. Of course, Mongo is super popular. And also just file storage, which can also be a, a useful way to go. Um, you can also hook it up to, you know, API services, REST APIs, and SOAP services if that's part of what of what you need. And so this is really helpful for IoT. Um, you know, when when you finally, you know, have built your device and have the, the data at your router, you can then uh, hook it up to uh, any cloud and put that data into any database. And, you know, sometimes, um, uh, you know, this is, this is really key that the, the access is normalized. So, for example, um, once you can put it into one database, you can uh, then you know, switch that around on the Dream Factory platform and change later to another database. And so what we see sometimes is that, you know, sometimes the, there are customer installations of um, some IoT project. So, for example, let's say um, you're, you're getting heating and ventilation and cooling data, HVAC data from a building. Um, well, there's a big, you know, there's a big security issue there. I don't know if you watch the TV show, Mr. Robot, but at one point they were trying to turn off the HVAC in a data center to destroy all the data. So um, there really is a security issue with almost any IOT project. There's people, there's cars, there's, you know, windmills, whatever it is. And um, so then the customer says, well, we, we love your, your sensor array but we need to install this on premise or we need to install this on this particular cloud or you know everything we do is on vmware where's your where's your virtual appliance 
And so Dream Factory can really help with all those scenarios. And then, of course, the next shoe to fall is, you know, well, we put all of our data into MongoDB or into SQL Server or into some other, you know, data destination or data source. And, you know, since Dream, Dream Factory normalizes all the, all the data, um, all the API services that go into and out of the database, um, this really, really, really simplifies the job that you have to do as, you know, an IoT company in that you can install it on any, any customer destination, any cloud, and then you can support any database. So um, I think, you know, that on a very kind of basic level, I think those are some really important issues. Great. Thanks, Bill. I think that was a, a really good insights there. Um, I'd love to drill down a little bit, Johnny, on getting into a little bit more of the sort of technical um, details, not, not a real deep dive, but I'd love to talk about another really key standard, which is MQTT and how the, these protocols, you know, HTTP or REST APIs plus MQTT really um, fit together in an IoT con context. So could you talk a little bit about how you see that architecture working um, kind of end to end? So you've got devices on one end and then, you know, databases in the cloud on the other. How do these pieces fit together in a kind of cohesive way so that someone who's a practitioner can actually tie all of this stuff together? Sure, sure. So developers love REST. You know, given a chance, they would love to use REST across the spectrum, whether it is devices or uh, applications or databases. So REST has become the de facto standard for uh, any communication. In fact, even in microservices, the, the combination of HTTP and JSON is becoming the de facto standard for uh, intra-service communication. But when it comes to devices and when it comes to Internet of Things, Unfortunately, REST may not be the best solution. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. The first one is the devices and the sensors that we are talking about are not powerful enough to actually run a HTTP stack. Uh, forget about HTTP stack. They can't even run a HTTP uh, library uh, that can make uh, an outbound call and, and uh, receive the output or rather the response to do something meaningful, to do something useful with it. So these devices are very low powered, very constrained, uh, very tiny in terms of their capability on, on uh, you know, how they can communicate with the rest of the world. So that's where we need a very lightweight protocol and, and MQTT is the best candidate for that. So MQTT, uh, unlike uh, HTTP and REST, has a very low footprint. And the good thing is most of the microcontrollers and system on chip boards actually support MQTT out of the box. So it's fairly easy for developers to use a protocol like MQTT on these highly constrained, low powered devices. So that is one of the reasons why MQTT has to complement REST. That is the first thing. Second thing is REST obviously is a one way protocol. Uh, developers can make a request and the out output comes back as a response. And this has been a uh, very proven very familiar mechanism and pattern for a lot of web developers and mobile developers. But when it comes to Internet of Things and devices, it's not always a request response uh, pattern that actually works. So in, in IoT, there is a lot of machine to machine communication that takes place. For example, when the uh, air conditioner is, is running and the room temperature hits a specific uh, threshold, uh, maybe the smart thermostat has to send a message to the air conditioner to either switch off or to uh, turn that into an energy efficient efficient mode. So that is the communication which is which is very different when compared to REST. For example, the HVAC is sending uh, a message and the uh, the smart thermostat is subscribing to that message and then it sends another message and this can't be a plain vanilla REST API going back and forth. It got to be more of a publisher subscriber model. For example, the thermostat is subscribing to the temperature uh, of the of the air conditioner that is, is, is reporting or the room temperature. And it is constantly publishing that to which the uh, air conditioner is subscribing. And, and when the state of the air conditioner is also sent as a message back to the thermostat, so there is a communication that is taking place in a pub sub model and this is very anti-rest this is very anti-http in which there is 
uh, a publish subscribe messaging that is going back and forth so that is the second reason why developers need something beyond rest when it comes to iot so the first one was uh, a very low uh, powered lightweight protocol and the second one is uh, going for the pub sub and a message queue kind of a pattern so once we complement rest with these two capabilities uh, the, the solution becomes much more efficient and it becomes more and more clear on how the whole communication takes place so uh, invariably developers will end up using the combination of these protocols which is mqtt for machine to machine communication and rest for everything else so that's the reason why uh, i personally believe the lethal combination of MQTT and REST is very critical for the success of IoT deployments. Uh, it, it's not either or, or, it is basically a combination of these two. So, so that is the justification on why we, we actually need the combination. Now, getting into the stack and, and identifying how this all pans out and this all starts to make sense. So we have a very important aspect of an IoT platform which is called device management. So device management is very similar to user profiles in uh, a mobile backend as a service. Dream Factory also has a user management component. So all the devices that are participating in the solution stack and, and talk to each other and talk to rest of the stack, they need to be registered with this device registry. It's almost like yellow pages of all, all devices in the, in the stack. And, and that, is, that is very critical because when, when a company loses a sensor or a device or when it starts small functioning the device management is is the place where they will turn off and turn off the turn on the switches for example uh, a stolen sensor can become a, a rogue sensor over a period of time when it is tampered so the moment it is stolen the customer will go to the device management and says blacklist this device so that it never participates it never sends and receives any data from the platform so that is the role of device management it's very similar to the rbac uh, of a platform so when an employee leaves an organization uh, because he moves out of a group he automatically lo loses access to the platform so it's it's very similar when it comes to device management so think of that as a device profiling or device uh, database uh, so that is and, and and this device database is is going to be exposed to the uh, actual devices via mqtt that means when the machine is connected to the platform the authentication happens via tls or ssl uh, with the device registry so it, it basically does a handshake with the device registry and then uh, the authorization you know whether this device is capable of subscribing to a specific topic uh, whether it can publish to a specific topic whether it, it can connect or not the authorization also happens by uh, at, at the device management level by the device manager so that's a very important uh, piece of the of the overall stack that's where mqtt is used as the endpoint so just like mobile apps talk to the platform over rest devices talk to the platform uh, to the device management layer over mqtt now some of the capable devices or gateways can also start ingesting the data over http you know if they're capable enough they can absolutely use a, a simple http call for making this 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 outbound connection so the device management also exposes a http endpoint for slightly more powerful more capable devices so that is one of the aspects and after that it is all about a set of microservices that talk to each other for um, for example rules engine for routing logic, uh, business logic, validation of uh, sensor data, uh, some kind of schema transformation. So all of that happens within the platform. And finally, it, it, it actually comes out uh, through a business intelligence layer and shows up in the uh, powerful dashboards, uh, which, which are going to help the business decision makers take uh, informed decisions and actions uh, against these uh, sensors and devices. So I, I had a chance to uh, dissect Dream Factory and see how to make this IoT ready. So there are some interesting findings that I, I, I came out with. First thing is when we actually look at the Dream Factory stack, it is very modular. It is it's actually built on a set of principles that makes it highly scalable, highly modular and composable. And that works in favor of uh, Internet of Things. So 
the built-in database that comes with Dream Factory, whether it is SQLite or MongoDB or any default uh, uh, database that is used for persistence can be extended for device management. And the best thing is there are some open source projects. Uh, for example, there is Mosca, which is very popular among the Node.js developer community that can be complemented with uh, Dream Factory to expose the MQTT endpoint. So instantly the developers will gain access to the device registry uh, and, and like any other mature IoT platform, Dream Factory will now speak the lingo of uh, MQTT as well as REST. So, so it instantly becomes relevant for IoT developers. And from there, ver variety of components that are already baked into Dream Factory platform uh, will, will start uh, humming together to deliver the right solution. For example, if, if the developer is trying to ingest data to DynamoDB, he can create a, a very simple endpoint to represent DynamoDB and the data will now flow to DynamoDB or DocumentDB or any on-prem time series NoSQL database. So all of that is, is, is a few clicks away for developers. And, and one of the most powerful aspects that I have encountered in Dream Factory is the server-side scripting. So server-side scripting, uh, for, for, for those of you who haven't played with it, it is basically a layer that sits between the data uh, source and the consumers of the data. So any anything that is written or read from the database has to go via the server-side scripting pipeline. And that's where developers can inject JavaScript or uh, or PHP code to actually write some complex business logic. You know, for example, uh, here is the uh, uh, HVAC data that is coming into the platform and uh, what do you want to do now? So, so it is basically a very simple if condition that the developer will write in JavaScript and then he will send another message back to the thermostat uh, which will immediately send another message to control the HVAC temperature. So, this dynamic intelligent routing can be embedded as a server-side script. And the best thing is the server-side script engine in itself is a REST endpoint. That means the developer will never have to tinker with the platform or go back and, and actually touch the code that's existing. He can pretty much automate this entire thing from the command line. Uh, so any platform that, that is capable of uh, using a curl command, uh, whether it's a Mac or a Linux or a Windows, can actually can it can be used to update this rules engine which is nothing but a very tiny code snippet which is going to be embedded as a server side script within dream factory so uh, so to 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 summarize a uh, couple of additions and couple of existing capabilities to dream factory turns the platform into a very powerful iot stack so throwing something like mosca at the at the uh, uh, very beginning of the stack uh, to expose mqtt and then uh, leveraging all the existing components, whether it is a NoSQL database or cloud databases uh, or relational databases and the capability of converting SOAP to REST, which means you can also talk to your existing line of business applications. And finally, the power of server-side scripting, which will come as a, as a form of rules engine, uh, makes Dream Factory very, very ideal for developing sophisticated IoT solutions. Great, thanks. Uh, that was, I think, really helpful to uh, to hear kind of some of the details about how MQTT and, and REST uh, kind of work together. So I'd love to um, turn the discussion a little bit uh, away from the architecture, and I, we will point people to resources as well after this, so you can read up on more and, and, and get into some practical examples. I'd love to talk a little bit about Dream Factory, the roadmap. So Dream Factory, you know, as we discussed, is this really powerful piece of middleware that you can install. And hopefully we've given folks a good idea of how the architecture sort of works, at least at a high level. Um, so the question for Bill, you know, you have this great open source IoT stack here, and now you need to deploy it to production, and you need to monitor it, and you need to make sure that it's going to be kind of battle hardened. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we've thought about that um, from a technology and from a product standpoint? Yeah, absolutely, Ben. Um... I like, you know, Johnny's discussion about the difference between Mosca and MQTT and Dream Factory where, you know, Mosca is very good at waiting for things to happen. Mm -hmm. um, Dream Factory never waits for anything. It always gets a request and responds as fast as it can. And so, you know, a lot of our effort and work has been in making it as scalable and powerful as, and fast as possible for that 
that request to, to get responded to. And so, you know, it's written in Laravel, the core of it's in Laravel, PHP, which is kind of the master of request and response. If you think of high performance websites, you know, that's really what they're all about. And, um, you know, that scalability is really important. The, the Dream Factory platform is a stateless and immutable stack. So you can use it as an image on platform as a service or on Docker and Kubernetes. And then you can, you know, make as many different instances of that as you want. And then you can scale out any individual instance with multiple, um, multiple servers. And, you know, so there's vertical scalability, there's horizontal scalability. And, you know, that's a really important issue, especially for IoT because you know potentially some iot deployments are massive um, there's a lot more things than there are people out there and um, so that's a really important thing another related issue is the distribution of the stack and the round trip response times um, so for example you might need to run uh, you know a dream factory stack in Asia and in Europe and in North America to cover, you know, have really uh, good response times based on which cloud you've deployed it on. So, you know, all of those things are, are you know, really important. Another thing we've worked on is the ability to package up any Dream Factory installation or application and to move it uh, very seamlessly between instances. So that's really a way that you can deploy um, deploy a package across multiple instances and and that that package can include you know the the type of server side scripting and database connectivity and mobile applications or other applications uh, custom services that you might need for your particular dream factory back end um, security is really important we've talked about it um, already uh, we have a lot of great technologies there from saml and open id and active directory um, also, if you know if the the thing logging in is a device, we have API keys and you know the, the capability to build a registry as well. And you know Johnny talked about that a little bit. That's all really important. Um, Role-based access control can be set up, so you can do all kinds of clever things like you know your devices can only write to the database. And then when a human administrator logs in, they can read that information. So that's a very, you know, fundamental security layers that um, you can build into this that, that really make it a lot more secure. Um, Johnny mentioned server-side scripting and customization. I think, you know, that's really important. There's a lot of really simple, basic things you can do with that. I mean, you know, we, we talked, you know, for the ex example where, say, you're getting some temperature data into the system. Well, for example, you could only write the data when it's changed, and, to, and that can really cut down on the data stream that you're ingesting. Um, or, you know, you can compress it and send it to a, a database or whatever you need to do. So those are all good examples. Um, one thing that I think is kind of interesting is on a lot of IoT projects, you know, we're all thinking about the device and the network and getting the data. Um, okay, let's say you've got the data, then what? And, you know, so the other half of this whole equation is um, what do you do with it after you've, you've, you're getting that data? And that's where the real value of IoT happens is, is that access to that data and the ability to act on it. So, you know, one thing you can do, and we've had customers do this as well, is you know, of course, Dream Factory is a great mobile app development platform. Um, you can, you know, each application is like a mini website. So if you're, if you're building um, a single page app, say in Angular, then you can build a mobile or tablet or web application that looks at the data and analyzes it and, um, you, know, you know, can make decisions or can um, give you intelligence that way. Of course, uh, rich clients also work as well. Um, something we support. And, uh, you know, of course, you can also do things that are server to server and, and machine to machine. And we'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, we also su supply a whole bunch of client side example applications for things like Ionic and Angular and React and JavaScript and so forth that, you know, make it easy to build applications that um, 
run on top of the data and that can expose it in various ways. You know, one of the things that's also really important is that, you know, once you've got the data in, now you can set up uh, access to it in, you know, very simple ways through the REST API. So anything that supports a REST API at that point can read the data out. So we have customers using Informatica, using Tableau, all kinds of different reporting systems that you can just hook up to the REST API. So it really simplifies um, things there. And you know, lastly, I, you might have access to another machine that you want to control or to another partner, or maybe even to a developer ecosystem where they would have access to this data to be able to um, build their own applications on top of it. And you know, we see that as well with either networks of partners or um, networks of developers who are going to innovate on top of these um, interesting new data sources. So um, one of the things we can do is enable uh, partner access through API management to um, all of these different data streams or you know, developer access through um, you know, the ability to um, hook up and to maybe in a read-only fashion or a read-and-write fashion, look at all this data and build their own applications. So, um, so it's kind of, you know, Dream Factory kind of can help your IoT projects both coming and going, both to put the data in, and then once you've got a bunch of data, then creative ways to use it. Great, thank you, Bill. So I want to thank, uh, we're going to wrap up here now. I'd like to thank our speakers, Johnny and Bill, for uh, taking the time today. And, and I'd like to also thank everyone who joined today. Um, if you didn't catch it all, you can go back and listen to the recording. Well, we'll send an email out with the link to that shortly. Um, and I do want to share a couple things that you can look at. I actually put in the chat window uh, two really useful pieces of information. There's a, an IoT white paper that Johnny wrote recently. Uh, the link is in the chat window there. Um, you can always just Google search Dream Factory IoT white paper and it will show up there. And also, if you want to get into um, some hands-on examples, a tutorial for how to fit a lot of these pieces together, Dream Factory, uh, you know, Raspberry Pi devices, for example, uh, Mosca MQTT protocol, and see how it works end-to-end -to, -end to learn about it. Uh, go ahead and click on the link in the chat window, or you can always just Google search or use um, a search engine, Dream Factory IoT tutorial, and you'll see that come up. So thanks everyone for joining today, and um, good luck with all of your IoT projects. Thanks. <laughs>